So tonight we're going to talk about um, a little bit of background so you can understand why we're doing the stormwater utility. We're going to talk about credits and grants and then we'll address a bunch of questions at the end. We, we're getting a lot of the same questions from the community so we're hoping to address those right in the presentation. If you have questions that we haven't answered, feel free to ask us at the end. Thank you. Every part of the city of Peoria suffers from stormwater related issues. The first, second, and part of the third district have what's called the combined sewer, and we'll go, over, we'll show you a video of that that explains what that is. But as you go further up north, that is a completely separate sanitary and storm sewer system, and there are lots of storm water problems up in the, the north end, as well as in the first and second and third districts. So what are we talking about as far as storm water problems? This is Allen and Alta Culvert. If you remember a few years ago, um, the pipe failed unexpectedly. Um, the road had to be closed. We had to figure out how to fix it. It was a $1.2 million repair that was unexpected, not planned in the budget. This is one of the projects on our backlog. Um, as you can see in the pipe, it is rusted. And these corrugated metal pipes will rust out so that there's no pipe left causing the pipe to fail. This one's also in a creek, and you can see the erosion on the sides of the pipe. This is an example of a paved ditch. Um, if you look at the bottom, you can see the exposed rebar. Um, this paved channel is failing, and it's causing issues in the neighborhood. Here's another example of a culvert under a road. Um, again, corrugated metal pipe. The pipe is rusted. Some of the bottom is completely missing now. Um, there's also severe erosion on the ends. So what's happening there is as that uh, ground erodes, it's causing the road on top to fail. This is the only road into an area that has lots of apartment buildings. So if this pipe were to fail before we fix it, it would eliminate the access to all of those homes. We have over 400 projects on our backlog that we've already identified as needing repairs. Um, the pictures show a couple more examples of pipes that are failing. Um, if you look at the one in the bottom um, that's full of sediment, that is maintenance that needs to happen. That pipe needs to be cleaned out. Um, the one that shows flooding, that occurred because of um, leaves blocking an inlet. So something rather minor to fix, but when you have 8,000 inlets to make sure they're clean, it adds up to a lot of time and effort. The city of Peoria has a combined sewer, or a CSO. Um, we are not alone. There are over 700 communities across the country that have this issue. Evansville, Indiana is one of those communities, and they've put together this video that explains CSOs pretty well. So I'm going to play this video for you. About 100 years ago, Evansville built its sewer system to carry stormwater away from streets. Later, when indoor plumbing was installed, homes and businesses connected their sanitary sewer lines into these storm sewers, making them combined sewer systems that carry both sewage and stormwater runoff. In dry weather, combined sewers carry sewage from homes and businesses to wastewater treatment plants. However, during heavy rain or snowmelt, these pipes aren't large enough to accommodate the combined sewage and storm water flow. Once the pipes fill up past a certain level, the surplus water and sewage in the combined sewer overtops a dam known as a weir. Then, sewage flows into waterways, creating a combined sewer overflow, or CSO. The CSO area in, in the city is eight square miles and it's the oldest parts of town. The city is proposing a solution to the US EPA, which is 100% green infrastructure to solve the CSO problem. What that means is we will be building lots of best management practices that infiltrate stormwater into the ground or at least store and hold it until the, the storm has passed and there's capacity back in the pipe. Green infrastructure is also good for the entire city. Um, up north where we have steep ravines and natural uh, open channels, when we put water in pipes and shoot it into those systems, 
the velocity of that water is so high that the, the, the dirt just can't handle it. So it causes severe erosion. We have huge erosion issues up in those areas. Green infrastructure is also good because it's treating the water where it hits the ground. It's keeping it out of the pipes. Um, it's gonna minimize flooding. Um, it's basically gonna solve all of our problems. <laughs> um, just kidding, that was a joke. Um, but it also is gonna help beautify our city. Um, we can build it with local labor. Um, if we were to do it, the CSO solution with a gray solution, that's a four mile long, 11 foot diameter tunnel that would have to be built by overseas contractors. With green infrastructure, we can build that with local labor. Um, you'll get to see the best management practice, practices on the surface. You'll actually get to see where your money is going as compared to a tank that was built underground. Green infrastructure is being used on city projects now. Um, we have them, um, we're trying to incorporate green infrastructure into every project that we have, if possible. Some of it is above ground and you can see, like the Adam Street Pilot Project, where we have rain gardens. Maine University has rain gardens. Um, and then there's other less obvious green solutions. Um, we've got some underground detention or infiltration trenches on the university project. Um, the university project that's coming up this year will also have underground detention and storage. Um, we build permeable pavers. We have a road um, that's permeable pavers completely. We've done permeable pavers in parking lanes. We've done permeable pavers in bike paths. So the city is exploring lots of best management practices um, to help infiltrate that water where it's hitting the ground. Stormwater utility. Stormwater utility is an enterprise fund that is dedicated funds for wet weather issues. It can't be used for a fire truck. It can't be used for road projects. It has to be used for wet weather issues. It's a utility, so if you use the system, you're going to get a utility bill. You have to pay into the system. Just like if you have a water line, you get a water bill. Stormwater is the same thing. You will get a bill if you use the system. So what does that mean? Do I use the system? The stormwater system is kind of complicated. It's not like a sewer or a water line where you have a pipe that goes from the treatment plant all the way to your house. The stormwater system consists of both public and privately owned pieces of infrastructure. The most obvious one that everyone thinks of are the inlets in the street and the pipes under the ground, but also ditches. The curb and gutter actually conveys runoff. Um, open channels, such as the ravines and creeks we have talked about, um, detention basins, all of those components are part of the, in, the stormwater structure, infrastructure, and that's what the stormwater utility will be funding. We will be investing in both public and private infrastructure because that is what our system is made of. So how do we calculate the rate? The rate is based on impervious area. What we do is we take an aerial image and we measure the area on each individual property. In this example, the orange area is the roof and the gray area is the driveway. The average residential customer has 2,600 square feet of impervious area. Our billing units are 1,000 square feet is one billing unit. <coughs> One billing unit is $3 per month, so the average residential monthly bill is $7.80. We will be sending the bills out quarterly though, so you won't get a $7.80 bill, it'll be billed quarterly. The schedule was that the stormwater utility was approved in December, and it is going to be up and running in June. So there's a lot of work, including measuring those areas that need to be up and running. What we are targeting is the first week of May, of having a new website and a map where you can go and look up your impervious area. This slide shows some example um, business rates. It's really hard to do an average business rate because business sizes are so variable that an average really doesn't mean anything. So this kind of gives you an idea of three specific businesses and what their rates would be. We do have rate adjustments built into the schedule. Um, right, We're kind of ramping up to the fully funded level and this shows you what those numbers will be in the next couple of years. So what exactly is the stormwater utility going to pay for? It's going to pay for system planning and asset management. What that means is that we are going to evaluate our assets, look at them, understand them, and figure out where's the best way to invest 
you know, which projects are the best for us to invest our money in? Where are we going to get the biggest bang for our buck? Um, runoff and pollution reduction. We're going to have increased street sweeping. We will have street sweeping once a month instead of right now, twice a year. That's going to remove the pollutants that are on the street and keep them out of the stormwater structures, keep them out of the river. Public works equipment, that includes those street sweepers I was just talking about. It also includes the backhoes and the trucks and all of the, the items that the city uses to make those small repairs on a day-to-day -day basis. This will pay for our capital program. So what the big projects that we will be doing to that we will be fixing, like the slides we showed at the beginning, but it also be paying for maintenance. So our own crews making small minor repairs and doing day-to-day -day work on stormwater infrastructure. And of course, we're going to invest in green infrastructure throughout the entire city. So credits and grants, this is why we're all here. The city has been doing our homework. We've spent a lot of time researching other communities, talking to other communities, and even visiting other communities to find out what has worked for them, what is the industry standard, and what should Peoria be doing. We also had a stakeholders group that helped us come up with the framework of the stormwater utility. This is a list of some of the participants in that group. We are currently exploring credits and grants. Credits would be an ongoing reduction in your stormwater bill, and a grant would be a one-time reimbursement. So what would, would a grant look like? Um, we're gonna have a rain barrel grant. Up to two rain barrels per property, we will pay you $50 for those rain barrels. The rain barrels need to be emptied within 72 hours though. The advantage of a rain barrel is the capacity to store water, and if you don't drain it, it doesn't have that capacity for that next storm. So we do ask that people drain those within 72 hours. Natural area maintenance. Um, this is for um, prairies, forests, bluffs, any natural areas that are out there that are being actively maintained. So you're putting money, sweat, equity into that infrastructure. We have a stream buffer ordinance that requires these natural areas to be along the streams. So if you're actively maintaining that, you would be eligible for this grant. The green infrastructure grant. The city is going to be building green infrastructure, but we're also encouraging everyone else to build green infrastructure as well. This grant will help pay for the cost to build the green infrastructure. It's not going to pay for the whole cost but it's going to be a partnership with private property owners to build green infrastructure. Some of the common ones that you might think of would be rain gardens or permeable pavement. Right now we have maximums on this grant and this is set at more of the residential level. We are still working through whether we should increase those limits to larger commercial areas so that to encourage larger parking lot projects to go to permeable pavers instead of just a small driveway. So we would appreciate feedback at the end of, um, or if you have ideas on how to make this grant apply to everybody, we would appreciate any information or thoughts you would have. The private property drainage assistance program, we've had this program for a long time. Um, it reimburses a project 75% of the project cost up to a maximum of $7,500. These are typically small projects that the owner and a contractor can figure out what the solution is. The funding is on a first come first serve basis. The city council will set the grant funding level and then it just goes as projects come in, if they, are, if they meet the program requirements, we just go down the list until we are out of money. One of the things about a city grant for construction is that it does trigger prevailing wage requirements. So if you hire a contractor and use grant money to pay for that contractor, you have to pay prevailing wage. That is state law, it's not a city requirement. We are required to do that. This is a new program that we're proposing and it's basically the private property drainage program but on a much bigger scale. This is for a project that needs engineering help. This is a project that is much larger, much more complicated, much more complex. Um, and we're gonna reimburse 75% like the private property program but up to $100,000. 
This will be a competitive grant. We will have an application period where we will be accepting grants. We will evaluate the grants, not only compare to each other, but to, com to compare to city projects or to compare to our um, biggest bang for the buck, like making sure that that, that project will actually make a sense and make a difference because it is city dollars that are being invested. And again, prevailing wage will be triggered because it is city funding. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears and go on to credits. The rate reduction credit is basically detention. You have stormwater coming in at a very fast rate, you're slowing it down and then releasing it at a slower, way, a slower rate. If you meet our current ordinance requirements, we will give you a 10% grant. If you exceed those requirements and can accommodate the 100 year storm, we will give you a 25% credit. So we're gonna give you an extra credit to go above and beyond. Detention is already required by ordinance for larger projects and has been since the 1990s. So this has been a requirement for quite a while. A volume reduction credit, this is infiltration most of the time. Um, the, the ordinance was passed in January, or went into effect January of 2017 that now requires this on all projects that are uh, all large projects. If you meet the ordinance requirement, we will give you a 15% grant or 15% credit. If you exceed that and use the, what we're calling the 2.61 inch CSO storm, which is a storm the city is required to manage, we're gonna give you a little bit extra credit, 15%. We're also gonna have water quality credits. Uh, right now it's set if you remove 75% of total suspended solids, but we are open to any ideas that people have of, of improving water quality. So if you can remove another pollutant or there's some other um, concern on your property with your drainage and you want to reduce that pollutant, please talk to us and we'll evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Direct discharge credit, if you are along the Illinois River and your runoff drains directly from your property to the river, it cannot cross another property line, it cannot go into the street, it has to go straight from you to the river. If that's the case, you are not using any of the system so that we will give you a 90% credit. Educational credit. The recycling in our country has really picked up due to education of the students. The kids learn about recycling, take it home, educate their parents, and that is how recycling has really expanded in the US. We're trying to model that program by providing a credit for each student that is taught about stormwater, clean water, um, any of those types of environmental needs. That way we are hoping to spread the message through the kids into the parents and back into the community. We also know that there are going to be ideas that we haven't thought of. There are gonna be products that come out in the future that can address stormwater runoff. We have an innovation credit. If you have a great idea that we don't have, that doesn't fit into one of these categories, come talk to us. As long as you are managing your runoff on your property and can show us, you might be eligible for a credit. So how to apply. The credit manual is gonna to go to council on May 8th. So it will be available soon after that date, assuming that they're okay with it. At that time, you will be able to download the forms and get all of the information. Once you have the forms, you need to attach your fee and send it to the city. The city will review it in general in 30 days. At the beginning, if we get a lot of applications, it might take us a little longer. But the good news is, is that the date you send your completed application in is the date that your credit will start once it's approved. So it might take us a little longer if we get overwhelmed with credits, but we will do our best to get those out as soon as possible. If the credit is denied, um, you will be given a report of what happened or what, why we don't like it, what needs to be changed, and then you have the option of making those changes or there'll be an appeals process if you disagree. Application fees. Um, it takes time, city staff time, to review these application fees. So in order to reduce the cost of the administration of the program, we're asking that people who want to use the programs to, to pay towards that administrative cost. The Stormwater Infrastructure Investment Grant application fee is large, but that is, an, uh, that is a project that will get up to $100,000.
It's going to require a lot of engineering time in reviewing the applications and making sure that everything gets built. So we thought that was a fair assessment of, of splitting that fee um, in that way. If you have um, comments, please fill out your sheet and we'll have um, some, some workshopping we can do at the end. But um, if you want to comment on those fees, p please feel free. So how do you keep your credit? Best management practices need maintenance. All infrastructure needs maintenance, and we understand that. So we are requiring that you inspect and maintain your best management practice. We are going to allow self-reporting. So you're going to inspect, you're going to do the maintenance activities, and then you're going to tell us what you did. And we're going to put it in the file and keep your credit. If you don't tell us that you did it or didn't do it, we're not going to know, and that would leave you in jeopardy of losing your credit. Green infrastructure is good for everyone in the city. It helps the combined sewer area. It helps the stormwater area. It treats stormwater where it hits the ground. We're using these credits and incentives to not only help reduce your bill, but to also uh, promote change. We want people to manage their stormwater runoff. We want you to understand what it means. We want to increase the, the water quality and improve our city. And also, if we do rain gardens and put plants in, we can beautify our city at the same time. All right, these are the frequently asked questions that we've been getting, so hopefully we can answer a bunch of your questions that you probably have. Can I use my existing best management practice? So if you have an existing detention pond that your subdivision drains into, can you use it? The answer is it depends. It depends on if it's been maintained. It depends if it was built to the standards that it was approved to be built to. If that's the case, then yes, you would be eligible for a credit. If you haven't had any maintenance, your detention pond is half filled in with sediment, it doesn't have the storage volume that's required, then no, you would not be eligible for a credit. What about brick and gravel? There's a lot of misconceptions about brick and gravel. People think they're pervious, water can drain through them. Um, We'll start with brick. In general, if you have an, especially if you have an old brick um, driveway or patio, the bricks were really close together. They're built on maybe a sand bedding course and then dirt. There's nowhere for the water to be stored. For gravel, unless your gravel is clean gravel with no fines and designed to store water, it's probably not impervious. Or pervious. When we build a road project, we tear out the old pavement and have exposed dirt, the first thing the contractor wants to do is get all the rock down so they have an all-weather surface. So compacted gravel is not a permeable surface. What about cisterns? So if you don't have a cistern, I'll explain what they are. They're basically buried rain barrels, for, for lack of a better description. The problem with the cistern is they're buried. So when we talked about the rain barrels, you have to drain the rain barrel in order to have the capacity back for the next storm. So if you just have a cistern and it's full of water, that next storm can't go into that cistern. So in general, cisterns are not going to be eligible for a grant or for a credit. Now, if you come back to us and say, I'm going to put a pump in, I'm going to drain it within 72 hours and have a plan, we would look at that as part of an innovation credit. What if I drain down, my downspouts to grass? Grass has runoff also. All surfaces generate stormwater runoff. The difference is in the amount. There's much more runoff that comes off of a, of a concrete driveway or an asphalt driveway than comes up with a grass surface. If the city were to do a complete drainage analysis of the over 4,600 or 46,000 parcels in the city, it would be a lot of engineering time, a lot of money, and in general, you're going to end up with about the same cost distribution as if we just use impervious area. It is common to use impervious area as the method for stormwater utilities, and that's the method we've chosen. But no, you're not eligible for a credit if you drain to grass. What about low-income residents? The stormwater utility is a, a utility. It's based on usage. We've done some research with other communities to see if anyone has a low income program. And for the most part, we have not been able to find any with the other communities around the country. We are still looking into this to see if we can come up with some way that makes sense to have something that would work. 
but at this point in time, it is not looking like that's going to be very feasible. If I drain to a creek, ravine, or a lake, am I exempt? No. If you go back, if you remember back to the slide of what is stormwater infrastructure, the creek, the ravine, and the lake are all parts of the stormwater infrastructure. The city will be investing in that public and private infrastructure. So no, you will not be exempt. If I drain to Peoria Heights, the county, or any of the other communities around here and don't drain towards the city, am I exempt? No, you are still part of the Peoria community. You still live in the city limits. You still get all the benefits of the stormwater, structure, or stormwater infrastructure system. So what's coming next? Um, you had asked if we will see sample or get the ability to see your bill. Yes, we will have a website ready at the beginning of May and you will be able to see your, your property and you can search throughout the, the city if you want to see how much impervious area is spread out across the city. We have this meeting today for the credit manual. We also have another one next Friday during the day. Um, we will be sending out informational mailings, including a sample bill. Those will go to your house. Those will go to where um, the GIS system shows that the property owner is. That we're using the county um, tax records of property ownership as our uh, owner of record. The utility goes into effect on June 1st. The first bills won't be sent out until um, July, August, and September. We're splitting the city into three different billing cycles. So depending on what billing cycle you're, you're on will determine when your first bill is. Um, everybody's bill will start June 1st. So if you get a bill in July, you will only be paying for June. If you get a bill in August, you'll be paying for June and July. If you get a bill in September, you're paying for the full three months. And then the cycle just continues that way. So every three months you will be getting a bill. But your first bill and your second bill may be different if you're in that as we ramp up to get the utility started. Why aren't we combining this with property tax? Why aren't we combining this with property tax? We are looking into that right now. Um, part of the problem is, is that the stormwater utility master database or the customers isn't identical to um, like the garbage system. Um, so we're trying to figure out how, how to do that, how to make it work. Um, the other problem that happens for right now is that the county bills are, aren't, like the timing doesn't line up for the tax bills. So we're gonna have to bill individually at least until we can get onto their cycle. But we are investigating that effort in order to reduce our administrative costs. What are you gonna do for people that don't pay the bill? So the question is, what are we going to do for people who don't pay their bill? Um, that is another reason why we're looking at putting it on the tax bill is for collection rates um, to be higher. Um, we're also trying to um, see if we can work with Illinois American Water and the Greater Peoria Sanitary District to get water shutoff rights. So that they don't, so that they don't pay the bill, that we can shut their water off. We don't have those details worked out. It takes a long time to work through um, those issues, but that is on our radar and we are checking into it. In the short term, what is gonna happen is if you don't pay your bill after you reach a certain limit, you will go to collections. If that doesn't help getting our, our revenue, then it will end up being a lien put on the property. So that is the short term answer. I'm planning on having various methods of billing. In other words, for the client, are they going to be able to allow it to be deducted the question is, are we going to allow multiple forms of payment? And the answer is yes. We are going to have um, an online system where you can pay through our software. Um, we're going to have lockbox services, which is like you can go to Kroger and pay your bill, or there are some other places you can go pay your bill. You can walk into the treasurer's office and pay your bill. They'll accept check, credit card, cash. Um, although I've been told not pennies, they don't want to see pennies, which is what I, I said we should all pay in. Um, but they'll accept, if you have a way to pay us, we are going to accept that form of payment. What office is going to be involved in the billing? A lot of them. Um, Public Works is helping generate the, the impervious area and the rates for the customers, because that's more of an engineering task. Um, the treasurer's office receives all of the payments by ordinance. 
um, through the city. So all the money goes through the treasurer's office, but then it goes into our finance who puts it into the account so that it can be spent um, on, on projects. So it's gonna touch a few hands. Our IS, IT, you know, our IT department will be involved with the software and technology and getting up. So it's, it's a pretty big undertaking. That's why I was saying that, that this six month window that we have is really, really tight for us getting all of this stuff put together. So the question is, are we going to um, replace stormwater infrastructure? She has pipes in her yard. Um, and then the other thought was, if we're gonna tear up the infrastructure in her yard, she wants to know so she doesn't build a rain garden. So the answer is, you need to talk to us before you build it if you're next to a pipe. That's the short-term answer. Um, as far as are we going to be replacing it, we are working on televising all of our pipes in the city. So that means we're sticking a camera down in the pipe so we can see what they look like. It's really hard when you're walking along the surface to know what's happening to that pipe to know if it needs to be repaired or not. Right now, we're waiting until it, it's failing and the surf, you, know, you can see the failure from the surface and then we go and repair it. Um, using the stormwater utility funds, we'll have the money to invest in the inspections, invest in the, the, the maintenance so we can line the pipe. You know, we've put a liner through the pipe so we don't have to dig it up, especially along the sides of houses. We have lots of pipe that are within 10 feet of a house and it makes all of us in construction very nervous when you have large equipment digging and swinging right next to a house. So if we can get to it sooner, we can line it, which is also cheaper, less disruptive. Um, it's a, a lot better uh, deal for everybody. So the question is, will this money be, is it guaranteed to be used for stormwater or could it be dropped into the general fund? Um, it has to be used for stormwater. Um, the ordinance is written that it's a utility, it's called an enterprise fund. So there are legal requirements now that say that it has to be used for stormwater or, or wet weather issues. The question is, what is basically our funding level for the first year? No, I'm going to receive, not what you got to spend. Right, so what we're going to receive is revenue. The first year is a half a year because it starts in June, so it'll be about $4 million. And then the, the full year, so next year, it will be $8 million. Four. So the question Four. is, are we going to bill the tenant or the landlord? And the answer is we're billing the property owner of record. So whoever owns the property and the address that they have in the system uh, registered with the county will get the bill. So if we attach it to, so the question is, will it be better for everyone if we attach it to the, the somehow have sh water shut up rights? Yes, um, but it run, when we do that, it runs into problems with um, owner tenant type of situations, but that would be our hammer. So that's what, you know, we're gonna try and, and go down that road if we can get Illinois American on our side. So the question is, this, is this going to help pay the fine for, I'm assuming you're meaning the CSO issue yes, that we're being CSO. sued by the, the US EPA? Yes. Um, this can be used for wet weather needs. I don't know if we've identified if it will be used for the fine, but it will definitely be able to build green infrastructure in the CSO area, just like it's building green infrastructure citywide. I mean, I understand that, but I know initially when they talked about rolling the whole program out, it was discussed that we were being sued by the EPA mm -hmm. and that there was going to be a fine mm -hmm. and they were trying to figure out how we were going to pay this fine and that is when yes they talked about the utility fee they talked about green infrastructure but the fine is coming somewhere down the line it's being negotiated yes. so i don't know if that's going to be another <coughs> on top of the fee to help pay for that because it has to be paid for. Right. So the CSO solution, the green infrastructure solution, is on a whole different magnitude than what the stormwater utility will pay for. The CSO solution is going to be 200 to 250 million. We just said that you know the stormwater utility is going to be 8 million and it has to be spread citywide. So it's going to pay for a part of the CSO solution, but city council has to determine how the CSO will be fully funded. And since we don't have that agreement yet, they haven't finalized that um, payment package or that, that funding plan at this time. And we need to look at that. Like we need to dial in on those application fees. Right now we've got some numbers out there to kind of get public feedback and comment. Um, we've, we've talked to some of our en engineering community 
about the application fees for the, the larger type of projects. You know, it has to make sense. We want these credits to uh, be the incentive for people to change behavior. So we're not having credits that you don't make financial sense. That's not our intent. We're not trying to make credits that we don't want people to use. We really want people to use them. On the flip side, you know, it might not make financial sense for your property, but it might make financial sense for everyone else in the room. So we have to kind of dial that in a little bit and see what we can come up with. And the other thing to consider is that someone at the city has to review that credit application. So there's time that has to be spent in, into that. So that's why the fees are kind of set where they are now is based on what we thought um, a reasonable amount. And it's not, the, the application fees do not fully fund the time that staff would need to do it, um, but at least it kind of helps balance it. So we need to, to work on finding that sweet spot of you know, covering administrative costs and yet making the credits still something that um, people are going to apply for. The other thing that we can do is if no one is using a certain credit, we will start to investigate why, right? We want the green infrastructure out there. We want these things to be built. So if no one is using them um, over time, we can revisit this and adjust those um, credits down, or the application fees down to encourage that behavior. The first question was, are we using landscapers or can we use landscapers to help in the review process? And the second is, how long is it gonna to take to get your application reviewed? So the first question is, are we working with landscapers? At this time, we are so focused on getting the utility set up, up and running. But yes, we absolutely are committed to doing contractor education, landscaper education, um, engineer education on this topic because we want there to be skilled labor that can build green infrastructure. We need it for city projects and we want you know, private property owners to build it too, so we've got to have those resources in the community in order to construct those. As far as the timing goes for this, um, the, the credit manual should be ready in mid-May, assuming that you know, everything goes smoothly with council. Um, and then you could start you know, your application process. We've, the ordinance says that we have 30 days to review, but if we're gonna get hundreds and hundreds of applications and credits and appeals at the beginning, it's gonna take us a little bit of extra time. Um, but we will do the best we can to get that turned around as quickly as possible. So yeah, we absolutely want to get the contractors educated. So that, one, so that they'll bid on projects. So the two questions: um, How or what is the source of our data for the aerial imagery? And that is the Peoria does a flight. They have um, planes that fly over and take pictures of the whole county. So we're using that data. And why did we go with the measured impervious area? Um, we had good data from an old flight from 2008. So we knew the information was, wasn't going to take us a whole lot of time to get put together. It still takes time as we you know, update and increase our, our uh, impervious areas. Um, but now everybody's property is their own. It's real. It's not an average. You're not paying for more than your neighbor or less than your neighbor. Or you're not paying the same when you really should be paying more or less. So this is a true cost for each individual property. We would have had to measure the commercial properties anyway. So it, it wasn't that much more effort for us to just do it, do it all at once. The problem with the data that we have now, this is gonna get complicated, when they fly over with an airplane, they don't take a picture straight down on top of every building. So they have flight patterns, and that causes some skew in the pictures. So what we're doing is we're measuring off of the base or the foundation of those um, houses. We're not gonna get paid for the side of your house that's leaning over. Um, but we're measuring from the foundation. So when you look at the imagery in the mapped areas, they're not going to be a complete visual, um, like it doesn't completely visually mesh together because of that skew. So we will have that information available. We'll probably turn that aerial imagery off so that it doesn't cause that confusion, but you should be able to see your property and the outline of your, of your impervious area so that shape should still be consistent to what you're picturing your property should look like. So the question is, some homeowners associations don't allow overgrown um, plant material, and the city also used to have an ordinance that um, would address that same issue. We have worked with our planning department and have redefined what um, plantings should look like. Um, they are not well educated on green infrastructure and native plants yet. This is a learning process for all of us. Um, there are native plants that all, you know, all of the staff in the city, we don't know everything. Um, so what we're, we're trying to encourage 
the inspectors to do is if they see something like that, that they talk to the property owner and ask, what is this? What did you plant? And are you maintaining it? The definition now is based on maintenance. So if you intentionally plant something and you're maintaining it and you want it, you know, that's different than you just let some weeds pop up and even though they're native plants, you're not really doing anything to maintain them. So it's a different level and a different um, perspective on what they define as weeds now. But we are gonna, I mean, that is gonna be a, an uphill battle as we transition to green, just getting people used to the less manicured look. Although green infrastructure can have the manicured look if that's how you design it. Okay, so the first question is what do we define as a permeable surface? Um, and the real question is, is how am I storing that water? So it's not about the surface and how the water is getting in, but it's about the amount of water that you're managing in the best management practice. So your top surface can be a variety of things. It could be permeable concrete, permeable asphalt, pavers, um, however you want the top surface to look, but it's more about what's underneath that's important as far as the stormwater management. Um, and that leads into your next question was, what is this infiltrate the one inch and the 2.6 inch once storm? So when you go into engineering and you learn all about hydrology and hydraulics, they tell you that, you know, how to calculate the volumes of runoff that you need to manage. And right now it's one inch over the square foot area. And that gives you the volume of water that you need to retain in order to reach that storm. So for the 2.61, it'd be 2.61 inches times the area. And that gives you the volume that you would need to treat in order to be eligible for a credit. We are hoping to have um, calculators to help people figure this out, because if you're not an engineering person, it's a little complicated. Um, and we are working on that now. Um, some of it is even having a simple calculator when you talk about permeable pavement gets complicated because as you build more and more permeable pavement, you've your, your area has increased, but your surface of pavement has increased. And so it's kind of this chicken and egg calculation. So we're trying to figure out how to do it in a manner that someone can go just add in a couple numbers and it tells them what the answer would be. So basically it, it refers to how much like rock and sand and all of that. How much water you have to manage. And then however much water you have to manage then will lead you into how big of an area you need based on what you're using. So if you had a big pipe that you were managing the water, it would be smaller than if you had rock because the rock takes up some of that volume. I'll talk to you afterwards, it's complicated. <laughs> the question was, are we just looking at the property lines? Yes, you are not paying all the way out to the street. The sidewalks in the right of way, you aren't getting, getting paid or charged and the roads aren't, you aren't being charged. Just the impervious surface on your property. Yes. Are there properties that are exempt from this? It is, the question is, are there properties that are exempt? The answer is no. It is a utility. If you use the service, you pay. Um, the closest thing we have to that would be the direct discharge credit for the Illinois River. And that's only if you go right from the city of Peoria property to the Illinois River where the city has no um, maintenance responsibilities or, or investments or cost into that system. Where is it would be not exempt in this county? I'm sorry? Church property? With church, pro church properties have to pay. Um, hospitals have to pay, school district has to pay, park district has to pay. All nonprofits have to pay. This is not a tax. It's based on usage of the system. And I know that's hard to understand, but if you think of it this way, picture the hospital or a school. Huge buildings, huge parking lots. So if they weren't paying into the system, that, that cost would have to be redistributed through all of the other paying customers in the city. So the question is, are we trying to clean up the river? Um, for the CSO, yes, absolutely. We are being um, sued for violations of the Clean Water Act, and we need to reduce our CSOs to approximately one or under one. Why would we not care about water that drains straight into the river off the property? It goes through absolutely no filtration. All stormwater does that, or most stormwater does that. Most of the stormwater system never goes through a treatment plant. It goes through creeks, ravines, pipes, culverts, all the way down to the... A lot of that gets sucked into the groundwater. So I'm saying if you live right next to the river and everything drains right into the river, you're giving them a 90% credit. They have no, no incentive to put any barrier to help keep the river clean. That doesn't make sense. 
That's a good thought. We are going to have boards at the back of the or in the, in the room back there that you can write suggestions on. And I encourage you to write that one down. Um, right now, the CSO, we are being fined for the bacteria that is getting put into the river from the raw sewage. So we're not getting sued for the pollutants like sediment um, and all the pollutants that sediment carries into the river. So it's a little bit different thing. Absolutely, we care about water quality. We absolutely want clean water, clean storm water, clean CSO, clean sanitary sewage after it's treated going into the river, but that's not exactly what we're being fined for. So the question is, if you don't live in the CSO area, you could do everything um, to manage your storm water and it's not gonna affect the CSO issue. That is correct. But what it will do is improve the streams and creeks and ravines that your runoff is going through. So that those pictures of the large erosion, those large pipes that are failing, your green infrastructure, not in the CSO area, will help those natural systems to kind of reheal themselves and get back to where they're in a, 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 a state that is stable. Right now they're eroding and, and moving and changing very rapidly. So the question is, are we going to be doing the same thing that GPSD, the Greater Peoria Sanitary District, is doing? Um, no. The Sanitary District is responsible for the sanitary sewers. Um, the combined sewers are the city of Peoria's and the storm sewers are the city of Peoria's. So the sanitary district invests in their um, infrastructure system and now this funding source will help the stormwater system and it will also pay for a little bit of the CSO system. This is, this is a different system so it's not, it's not a just shifting from one um, service provider to another. So the question is if you have a rain garden at your property already can you get a credit for it? Um, you would have to come in and talk to us. You wouldn't probably be eligible for the one um, as written because you probably didn't design it or size it to a certain storm. Um, but if you come in and talk to us, we can probably work something out through an innovation credit as long as you're managing that runoff. And you would only get credit for the impervious area that drains to that um, rain garden. But yeah, absolutely, we would wanna talk and um, give people um, the, the credit for doing that, the good green infrastructure. So the question is, how do we measure success on this um, program? There's a couple different ways. Well, and she asked if this was to, to make sure we got to the zero um, CSO events. We don't expect to get to the zero CSO events until we're fully implemented. And we think that's gonna take between 18 and 20 years to have the full CSO solution constructed. Um, but as we reduce the CSOs, we will see improvements. And that's one way to track and measure. The stormwater system gets a little more complicated because we don't really have meters. Um, that calculate the total amount of runoff. Um, but we, w we are planning on doing uh, metering and monitoring of all the green infrastructure the city is building so that we can show, you know, this BMP generally has this kind of return. This one, you know, this one works really good. This one didn't work so good. Um, we're going to kind of create that information to help. Um, in my opinion, what we would do would be a success is we get an understanding of what our system looks like. We get an understanding of what our maintenance needs and we can do proactive planning. So instead of having the Alta Radner or Alta Allen culvert fail unexpectedly at four o'clock in the morning, we know that that pipe needs to be repaired and we repair it before that happens. To me, that would be a measure of success, but it's hard to put into numbers and show it as a metric. Yes. I know we're being sued or fined, Will this totally, I know we have to pay that fine or solve it or something, but will this prevent future fines or are we guaranteed that? The question is, is will this prevent future fines? Um, no, because they're not really like linked together. Um, the CSO were being sued because of the violations of the Clean Water Act. The stormwater utility is going to pay a very small part of that full solution. So it's not gonna, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, even if it was gonna fully fund the CSO, which it's not, um, regulations change over time, which is how we ended up in the place we are now. We were in compliance, you know, 20 years ago. We're not in compliance today. So anytime in the future where we're not in compliance, we could be sued by the US EPA or the Illinois EPA. If regulations continue to change and we aren't prepared for them, then we would set ourselves up for potential fines. Um, we had mentioned earlier that stormwater runoff carries all the pollutants in the roads um, and all the things that are dumped into the street end up in the storm sewer system. 
there are people, and I'm one of them, that suspect maybe sometime in my lifetime, storm sewers are going to be regulated by the EPA on water quality based issues. Um, there was some, some talk a few years ago about controlling the amount of sediment that leaves a construction site to the level of actually pulling and monitoring samples. So the, the requirements or the, the information is out there about how dirty stormwater is. And so I would, like I said, I, I'm one of those believers that I think before, before I hopefully, while I'm still alive, I see this, um, this change to the water quality. If you think about the history of the Clean Water Act, um, when it started, we had rivers catching on fire. I mean, the water quality a few decades ago was terrible. Um, and so what they have done is they've picked different targets to go after to clean the water. The first was industry. When that happened, then they went off to the large communities, and then now they're into the medium-sized communities. So they're going to keep working on those pollutants until we get back to having clean water. So the question is, is the city going to have staff as a resource to help determine um, what you can do on, the, on your property? Um, the answer is probably in the future. Right now, we are so busy trying to get the utility up and running that we don't have any available resource that could go out and, and help with that um, type of effort. But absolutely, once that's up and running and going smoothly, that would become part of our normal operations. There, are there engineering firms in town? Yep, there's a few that are in the crowd here that I'm sure would be happy to talk to you. Um, but there are absolutely engineering firms that are in town that would help. Um, if we can get to the contractor training and the landscaper training, that would be another resource to have. And we hope to get to that. But like I said, we're just so swamped right now with uh, getting everything up and running. But that's, those are some resources you could reach out to now. The credit manual gives you a good idea of some practices uh, that you could use. And there is a ton of information out on the internet that other communities are doing. Um, Portland, Oregon has really good stormwater management. Seattle, Washington has really good stormwater management. Philadelphia has really good stormwater management. And DC Water also has really good information. Those are some that just come off the top of my head that would be good. The other thing you could check is other local communities. You could look to see what they're giving credits and what information they have out there. Right, so before you build something, definitely talk to us because we don't want you to build something and you, you be too small to be eligible for the credit or in the wrong spot to be eligible for credit. So if you're to the point where you're gonna build something, yeah, for sure, talk to us. Okay, so the question is, how did we finance stormwater infrastructure? How did we finance stormwater infrastructure before we created this stormwater fee? And that is a great question. The answer is it came out of the general fund or the sewer fund. So if it's in the general fund and you're a council person and it's a tight budget year, are you gonna fund the new fire truck, the new police officer, or fix, ro fix roads, or invest in this pipe that's underground that you can't see? You know, it's not a very hard political decision to invest in the visible things that people are asking for compared to infrastructure that's buried out of sight, out of mind. So that is another reason why this is a dedicated revenue stream that fire trucks can't use, police can't use, the roads can't use this. It has to be for that wet weather infrastructure. So does that open us up to not using it to fund stormwater needs? So there's a legal requirement of how much it needs to be used for stormwater needs in order for it to be charged. And if it's not, then it's going to have to be funded through a split source. So we could fund a backhoe with some stormwater funds and some general funds if it's going to also make road repairs. So the question is, if we're increasing street sweeping, what's going to happen with all the parked cars? Um, that is going to be a problem um, that we have to work through. Um, and when it happens, and it could be like large cities will have signage that says street sweeping happens on this day and this time frame, no parking. I don't know if we will get to that. I don't know how big of an issue it's going to be. Um, we're going to have to kind of work through it and see. Obviously, there are um, parking needs for people to be on the street, which is why they're there. Um, so we don't want to eliminate that. But we've got to work through and figure out a, a way to, to, to make it happen that we can accommodate both issues. There was um, someone posted that the street sweeping was going to happen between the hours of 10.30 p.m. and 6 a.m. Is that true? Um, I am not 100%. Scott is saying yes, it is going to happen at night. Our public works director is hiding in the back. So he says yes, that is when it's going to be happening. So that's when most people will be parked on the streets. I mean, the city of Chicago handles this. They put out big signs. 
right. Right. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. it, it's not an it's not an impossible. Yeah, it's not an impossible problem. The other thing we can do is put people on cycles so that you know, like you're educated that this day of the week, even if we don't have signs up, this day of the week is going to be street sweeping day. Just like you know what day garbage day is, right? So the same concept. If we can educate people to know, um, but we will address that as those problems come up, and we'll we'll figure out a solution. It's not an impossible problem. The question is, can credits be combined? Yes, as long as it's not the direct discharge credit. The direct discharge credit is on its own. I mean, you're getting 90%. You really don't need it anymore. Um, but for all the other credits, I think we have it capped at 50%. But if you add up all the credits, that's like getting all of them um, together. Yeah, so the question is, are new subdivisions um, being built with separated sanitary sewers and storm sewers? Yes, absolutely. The combined sewer system ended in the um, early 1900s. The um, greater... 1930, the Greater Peoria Sanitary District was built in the 1930s, and that's when the city stopped doing the combined sewers. Um, just for historical knowledge, combined sewers at the time was cutting edge technology, and we were the, the happening place to be, and uh, it was like cream of the crop. So that goes back to the question over here, are we going to get sued in the future? Um, we don't know, because sometimes you don't understand what the impacts of what you're doing are until late, later in the future. So the question is, if you have a dispute with what your measured impervious area is, there is an appeals process that is in our ordinance. So you contact Public Works and say, hey, I don't think this is right. Um, we'll send you a map or send you to the map so you can see the area. Um, and then if you still disagree, then you can come talk to us and say what areas you think are incorrect. And then we will we'll make an assessment from there and a judgment. But there's a whole process that's lined, uh, outlined in the ordinance. The question is, will the city do workshops to help people learn about green infrastructure and rain gardens in particular? Um, that is a great question, and we are looking at working with the park district, who does green things and plants and all of that, as a partner to do those workshops, because they're probably a little better suited to do that type of work than and us engineers who like to pave everything. So um, we, we are absolutely looking at doing some kind of educational effort for the community, as well as for contractors and landscapers. So the question is, do you need engineering upfront to get the credit? Um, the answer depends on what you're building. Um, if you are a new commercial building, a new large project, you have to get a permit through the city. All the, all the calculations that are, you're going to get credit for are required by ordinance in order for you to get the permit. So if you're doing something small, then it's not required um, to have the engineering upfront. It also depends on what type of credit you're looking for. The detention credit um, is going to be very challenging for you to do without engineering help because you need to have engineering calculations in order to determine how much detention you are providing. So it kind of depends on what, what you are looking to build. Is there an estimated life on a corrugated metal pipe? I would say not long enough. Um, I think it's 40 to 50 years is what they told us. I think you can still buy corrugated metal pipe today um, and I think they tell you it will last for 70 years. And um, anyone who works with me knows that if they put a corrugated metal pipe in the ground, they probably won't talk to them. So um, we, are, we are moving away from that type of system. It's a metal pipe with water running on it and water going at different levels. It's just not, um, it just doesn't make sense. Even with the coating, coatings get scratched during construction or with debris. Um, so we have, and we have parts of town that all of the construction has corrugated metal pipes. All of them were built in the same basic time frame. All of them are failing at the same time. So corrugated my pipes are a big issue in kind of the mid part of uh, where the city is as far as north to south. That section, they're failing all over the place. So the question is, if we haven't televised and we haven't done a system assessment, how do we know that $8 million is enough? Um, I will tell you $8 million is not enough. Um, because of the needs that we have already identified, $8 million is still not enough. Um, and as we go build more and more um, knowledge base of what our system is actually doing, like I said, there's a whole part of town where we know those pipes are failing. Because if one fails here, you know that pipe right next to it is probably failing. And right now we don't have money, so we just go, I don't see it, and just um, wait until it, it fails. Um, 
The issue is, is how much can we afford as a community to pay? What's the best solution? If we had all the money in the world and could fix everything, that'd be great, but that's just not our reality. Roads are a significant need also. We've underinvested in our road infrastructure. So we're trying to balance both of those systems and be um, as good as we can as far as um, cost management and spreading it between all of our infrastructure. Yes. Do you have an estimate of how much of this $8 million a year goes to administration and other overhead fees? We do have an estimate, and I don't know it off the top of my head, but we did, did a breakdown of the cost of where it would go. Um, some of the administrative costs is our permit compliance. So it's not just people sitting in the office pushing papers. That is very low. Our staffing is um, me and one other engineer. So we are not spending a lot of money on um, people resources. Um, but we do have administrative costs that would be in that category that would cover permit compliance and, and those types of things. Okay, I can... Estimate maybe 20%, 10%? Do you remember? We can get that to you. Come see me afterwards and give me your, your email address. I'll give you mine and we can get that back to you. But I, it was a long time ago that we put together that, that breakdown of costs. So I just don't remember off the top of my head. But and our estimates were based on projected spending. And now we're at this $8 million number, which was different from what was projected two years ago. So. Right. Scott, do you know what our estimated? I mean, uh, if, if it's purely administration costs, and you're talking not operations and maintenance and not capital, it's in the neighborhood of five to seven percent. So the answer was five to seven percent in the administrative costs. He's the budget man. So the question is, what are we going to spend our four million dollars on and um, how soon are we going to see some projects in the ground? Um, we have two projects that we are out to engineering firms right now to design. One was um, on one of the slides, the Oak Cliff Culvert. Um, that one, and then we have another wall project. These projects have been on our backlog for years, um, and one of them is a wall that is slowly falling in. Um, so we're we're thrilled to get that repaired. And then the Oak Cliff culvert, it's the only road into this complex of apartment buildings. So we are we are thrilled to be able to get that. Um, because it's our first year and we have lots of startup costs, like measuring the impervious area, figuring out the rates, it will be heavy in the administrative costs for year one as we get the program set up. Um, once we move forward, it, it will transition back to a lower administrative cost. Um, you should see two big, I'll call them, stormwater projects happen this year and be constructed this year. And we plan on posting pictures and updates and um, showing you all the cool things that, that we're doing with this, this funding. So the question is, if I want to build a rain garden next year, where do I go for information? Um, eventually, the city will be able to be that resource for you, right? but right now we just can't. However, if you are looking for rain garden information, the, the, the internet is a huge source of rain garden information. Um, Maplewood, Minnesota has rain gardens that are already set with the planting and the spacing and the sizing to give you information. Um, Kansas City had a 10,000 rain garden program. They have lots of information out there. Um, Wisconsin Extension Office has a rain garden packet for homeowners that explains like how to pick it, how to size it, all that information. So right now in the short term, I would say search the internet, type in rain garden, rain garden design, rain garden locations, and it will give you lots of information. Um, rain gardens are basically gardens that are in a hole or depressed. So they probably could do it. We have done some rain gardens with our private property program already, but like one or two. Um, so there are some resources out there. The Master Gardeners would be a great resource. The Park District would be a great resource. Um, those would be some, some places to start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We also have rain garden flyers, there, and we have them here. So if you want to grab one on the table in the back, that will give you at least a starting point of where to go. Okay, so what, the question is, what is a rain garden? How would you know how to design it? Um, a rain garden is a shallow depression that has plants in it that can tolerate being flooded. Um, the rain garden should drain within 72 hours, so these are not wetland plants, these are not water plants. The water is going to come in, it's going to set, the storm is going to go by, the rain garden is going to drain. So that's where you have to be careful with plant selection because it has to be plants that like to get their feet wet but don't want to be wet all the time. Um, there is lots of information out there. Like I said, we have a flyer in the back that gives you some starting point as far as plants that you can use. It tells you a little bit about how to size it. We are looking at getting a rain garden calculator where you can put in 
Um, my roof is a thousand square feet and it's going to drain to this rain garden. How big does it need to be in order to apply for this credit? We just aren't there yet, but we, we will have that tool available in the near future. Okay. You did say the fee is based on three dollars a thousand. Three dollars per thousand. Yes, what the stormwater utility fee is based on. Yes, it's three dollars per thousand square feet for the first year or the first year and a half. Yep. So the comment was, what are we? How are we addressing fixed income? And that goes back to what we were talking about with the low income. We looked across you know, the country to see if we could find some. And there's probably some out there for fixed income and low com income. They're just not very common. Um, it is a utility, so it's based on your usage. So the utility itself doesn't know who owns the property. It's only looking at the impervious area on the property. So it doesn't matter who owns it. So that's why it becomes more complicated to give credits based on who it is. So his comment is, is not only we're gonna be paying for our own property, but we're gonna be paying for everywhere we shop, everywhere we do business, because they're now paying into the stormwater utility. So my answer to that is that the stormwater utility is encouraging everybody to manage stormwater on their site. So if the grocery store builds a rain garden and gets credit, they're gonna reduce their runoff. They're gonna reduce their use on the system. If we, if we exempted all those people and only charged residentials, they'd have no incentive to do anything to manage their stormwater runoff. So your costs would actually go higher and higher and higher. Now at least there's some incentive for each of those businesses to reduce their costs because they don't want to raise rates. They don't want to charge their customers more either. But they'll, yeah. So this includes everybody that is connected in the so the question is, does this include everybody that's connected to the Peoria Sanitary District? No, this includes everyone within the city of Peoria limits that has impervious area that drains, that has impervious area. So it's all of the properties within the city. The Sanitary District actually has a bigger area than the city limits, and there is part of Peoria that is unsewered. They're on septic system. So GPSD and the city um, service areas don't line up exactly. Oh, why are, why are the, the question is why is Peoria Heights, West Peoria exempt? Um, because we can't charge them. <laughs> we would love to charge anyone who drains into our system, but there's no way for us to do that. Only the city of Peoria properties will pay a fee. So if you drain, if you're a city of Peoria resident and you drain into Peoria Heights, you as a city person is still going to pay the fee. Peoria Heights people don't pay the fee because it's not their infrastructure that they're maintaining in the same way that we wouldn't pay for Peoria Heights infrastructure. So the city of Peoria is not going to pay a fee for Peoria Heights roads. You just can't do it that way. The ordinance has written that there's a minimum charge per property because you are benefiting from the city stormwater infrastructure, whether you're you know, a big user or a small user. So the road in front of your, your house has stormwater infrastructure that's being used, whether it's a ditch or curb and gutter, um, you are getting a benefit. You also get the benefit from um, the permit that we have with the public education um, from the, the water quality things that we're required to do by permit. There is a benefit to your property even if you don't have a structure. But again, we have the handouts. Um, feel free to put comments on that. We'll have the, the boards in the back that you can write notes on. If you have comments, please feel free to um, leave your comments. If that's it, thank you guys for coming. You were a great audience. These were great questions. I hope you learned uh, something. And if you have questions, we have a website, onewaterpeoria.com. has lots of information. There'll be a new website at the beginning of May with lots of good information. So thank you, everybody.